Welcome to this video on the top 10 werewolves of the Fianna. The name Fianna is taken from the landless hunter warriors who fought beside the Celtic hero Finn McCool of the Finian Cycle. The werewolf Fianna are, in equal measure, poets and berserkers, hedonists and tricksters, thanks in no small part to their long connection with the Tuatha de Danann, the predecessors of the Changelings. Fair warning in advance. I may have a little trouble with some of these Celtic and Welsh names, so bear with me. But without further ado, the Top 10 Werewolves of the Fianna. Number 10. Boudicca. Boudicca was born in the 1st century AD to royalty of the Celtic Asseni people of Britain. According to the historian Tacitus, she was a tall woman with a harsh voice and a piercing glare. Boudicca was wed to Prasutagus, king of the Aseni, who ruled in what is today Norfolk, England. In 43 AD, the Roman Emperor Claudius sent four legions under Aulus Plautius to Britannia with the twin purpose of securing mines and slaves for the empire and denying the island as a safe haven for Gallic rebels. Initially, the Aseni sided with the Romans. Yet, the Romans did not eat a meal all at once, nor did they conquer a territory in one swoop. When the Aseni rose in revolt against the Romans who planned to disarm the native people, Publius Astorius Scapula put them down, though he allowed them to retain their independence. Elsewhere, the Roman colonists, usually former legionaries, turned Celts out of their homes and made them slaves if they resisted. When King Prasutagus died, he willed that his kingdom be held jointly by his daughters and the emperor. The Roman procurator, Catus Decianius was offended by the idea that a dead barbarian king would place his progeny on equal footing with the Emperor of Rome. He responded by sending centurions to sack the Aseni and confiscate the estates of their head men. The Romans also had Boudicca lashed like a common slave and her daughters raped in full view of their people. As her daughters were being violated by a cohort of Roman legionaries, Boudicca's rage exploded and she had her first change which ended in Roman dead bodies piled at her feet. In 60 AD, Boudicca, in alliance with the Trinovantes of southern Britannia, formed an army to drive the Romans from the island. Boudicca's army first fell on Camulodunum in what is today Colchester in Essex, former capital of the Trinovantes, and destroyed it. Boudicca's army then met the 9th Iberian Legion in battle under the command of Quintus Petilius Serialis, who had arrived too late to relieve Camulodunum. The Celts wiped out the Roman infantry, and Quintus retreated to the safety of his fortified camp with only his cavalry. The Roman governor, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, hurried back from Wales to take command of the situation. With petulous defeat, Boudicca marched next on Londonium, a newly created commercial settlement full of traders and Roman officials. Suetonius did not have the numbers or the position to defend the town and decided that it would be sacrificed in order to save the province of Britannia. The people wept bitter tears and begged the governor to stay and protect them. He responded by ordering his forces to leave, along with any who wished to take up arms as auxiliaries. Boudicca descended on Londonium and destroyed the town, along with its people, many of whom died by brutal torture, burning, impalement, mutilation, and crucifixion. Between Camulodunum, Londonium, and Verulamium, or what is today St. Albans, the Celtic Britons are believed to have slaughtered between 70 and 80,000 Roman colonists. But the slaughter gave the Romans time to regroup, as well as call in aid from darker quarters. Sown among the combined 10,000 men of the twin 14th Legion, the 20th Victorious Valeria Legion, and as many auxiliaries as could be mustered were servants of the worm, Fomori, dedicated to the beast of war. The battle between the Celtic Britons and the Romans took place somewhere in the Midlands. The Romans, though outnumbered, were better armed, better disciplined, and had chosen a location that protected their flanks from the Celts. The Britons were massacred by the Romans, and the warriors of the worm made certain to remind the victorious Romans of Londonium, which resulted in the slaughter of the Celts' wives, children, and even their livestock, which they brought with them on campaign. Boudicca ended her own life rather than be captured by the Romans, abused and paraded through the streets, and then executed. 
To this day, the Fianna of the Brotherhood of Hearn regard Boudicca as a hero of their camp. Number 9. Hegwith Abion. Hegwith Abion was an elder of the Dena Droid und Fleide, or men who turn into wolves in Welsh. Or I'll just say Welsh Garu. In the 9th century AD, Hegwith had the blood of heroes in his veins and in time earned the respect of the Garu of Kimra, or Wales. Young and ambitious Garu joined his sept. His followers begged him to challenge the Ard Ri of Ireland and claim rule over the entire Fianna, but Hegwith loved his native land too much to leave it for Silver Tara. In fact, he insulted the Ard Ri, who commanded Hegwith to appear at Tara for a feast. The Welshman replied bluntly that he had seen Tara before, and it had nothing that he couldn't find in his own land. This stinging dismissal soured relations between the Welsh and Irish Fianna for centuries to come. But Hegwed's greatest enemy was the Ged of Fenris, and the Saxons who were their kinfolk. The blood feud between the Fianna and the Ged lasted for a dozen years and bled both tribes of valuable warriors. In time, the Saxons learned to fear the woods of Kimra and to bar their doors and windows at night. But age and wisdom blunted some of Hegwed's hunger for vengeance. When the Black Spiral Dancers emerged from the depths of Caledonia in place of the White Howlers, Hegwed secretly met with the leader of the Get to join forces against the Worm Howlers, as the Fianna called them. They would heal the rift between them by fighting against the Dancers in the north. Yet, they were ambushed by unknown Garu. When the Irish Fianna arrived, many of the attackers were dead or dying, but so too were Hegwed and many of his warriors. Hegwed could be healed by the Fae, but they would require a year and a day to do so. Hegwith and his retainers were taken to a fairy burial mound to fool the Get into thinking him dead so that he could surprise them in the future, if indeed they were behind the ambush. A she-lord named Hirenhir Abgwidian swore a binding oath to protect the dun in which Hegwith was buried until his son, Digan, spoke a phrase that would awaken his father. However, the phrase was known only to Digan, who died in battle two months later. No other knew the location of Hegwith, nor the magic words to free him. A few centuries later, the Shi abandoned the mortal world for Arcadia, except for Hirenhir, sustained by his great power, who also kept Hegwith's resting place hidden. In the final days, Hirenhir's glamour is fading. The valley in which the burial mound is hidden is being developed, and whenever a new road or building is constructed, the weaver drains a bit of the fairy lord's power. Kiren here despairs that when mortals find the secret place, all will be lost, including him. Unless, of course, some Fianna warrior discovers, through a great quest or plumbing the depths of the Garu's ancestral memories, and uncovers the words of power to revive the great Welsh warriors of old, before the chilling power of stasis and banality traps them forever. Number 8. Blathed. Many Fianna call their leaders Ri, in keeping with the Celtic traditions of the tribe. However, the Welsh Fianna call their chieftain the Cernunos, the Horned One. The Welsh kings of the British Garu adopt the antler crown, a fetish formed from the skull of a now extinct great deer, as their symbol of office. In the Dark Ages, the Cernunos of Wales was Blathed, an elder Fianna Ragabash, and grandson of one of the greatest traitors in the history of the Dena Droid in Flaida. His grandfather had been seduced by an ancient gangrel who had come up from Macedonia named Stephanie. For this vampire temptress, the grandfather had given up his honor, his tribe, his life, and even his soul. Blathud learned of his grandfather's sins and swore to prove himself and cleanse his family's honor. He left Wales and traveled the Isles, keeping his name and lineage secret. He fought alongside the Fianna, slaying a thunderworm in Ireland and a vampire in the Scottish Lowlands. When he turned 18, he returned to Wales in disguise and presented himself to the Fianna as an orphan Cleath, without rank or renown. The spirits remained silent to Blothard's deception, knowing what he meant to do. In his homeland, he slew vampires from the hills and purged their human spies. Then he founded a pack of his own and waged war against the Black Spiral Dancers, reclaiming a Fianna Cairn in Northumbria from the Get of Fenris, 
with all of the trickery and bravery that befits a ragabash. He outwitted the Cairns totem and bested a Fenrir champion in single combat. As a young man of just 21 summers, Blothid challenged and bested the Cernunos in single combat and took the antler crown for himself. But rather than kill his predecessor, he made the man his advisor and worked to reunite the Fianna of the Isles, a task which met with some success, though not as much as he would have liked. But Blothud's grander ambition was to unite not only the Fianna, but the Fenrir and Silverfangs of the British Isles as well. When his rule was secure, Blothud revealed his true heritage and allowed the tribe to sit in judgment of him. The Fianna declared him free of his grandfather's taint and reaffirmed him as the Cernunos. But the one enemy he feared remained, Stephanie. The vampires who stole his grandfather's soul still wandered the hills of Wales. Blothard would see her in his dreams, beckoning him and mocking him. He knew that one night he would meet her and then face the greatest battle of his life. But he was content that if he would destroy the ancient vampire and himself, then it was a price that he would gladly pay. Then, and only then, would his grandfather's soul finally be free. Number 7. Leora Devin Leora was born in a small village in the north of France to a pair of Fianna kinfolk, though only one was vaguely aware of their heritage. And to say that Leora was a troublesome child would be an understatement. One minute she would be playing dress up with the other little girls. The next she would be rolling around in the streets having a punching, kicking, and spitting brawl with one of the local kids. And as soon as that was done, she would be sitting on the edge of a cliff, dreaming about what was on the other side of the seemingly endless sea. When she got older, she learned to check her temper, but when she saw another child being bullied, she would jump to the victim's defense, fist flying. Leora underwent the first change when some British boys tried to take liberties with one of her classmates while they were on holiday. The kinfetch led the Fianna right to the shocked Leora, cleaned up the bodies, and carried off Leora to a cairn in the south of England, where she underwent the rite of initiation. This particular cairn was under the influence of several members of the Brotherhood of Hearn. The Brotherhood of Hearn is a Fianna camp formed to defend cairns under attack from the Worm's forces by using moon bridges to rapidly transport from one place to another. The newly minted Arun Leora was spellbound by these old tales of fearless warriors which matched her own passion and worldview. But the Brotherhood was greatly diminished from its glory days. So, Leora dedicated herself to the restoration of what some Fianna called the Wild Hunt. Leora's Garu name, Burns the Worm, was won in the aftermath of an attack on a Welsh cairn. She used a brief reprieve to set a trap for their enemies. Her pack doused an abandoned building in petrol, then lured the wormish forces inside and locked the doors. Those Fomori and Black Spiral dancers who didn't die in the fire were easily run down by the wild hunt. When Malcolm Sutton, leader of the Brotherhood of Hearn, fell at the claws of the Black Spiral dancers, Leora stepped into his position unopposed. Under her guidance, the Brotherhood has drawn in young Fianna from around the world, eager for the opportunity to gain renown and honor for themselves and to protect the cairns of the tribe. Number 6. Gold Makmorna Gold Makmorna was born 35 or 40 years ago in the hills of Northern Ireland in a village of Fianna and kinfolk that has remained largely untouched by the passage of time or the machinations of the weaver. Gold's village, led directly by the Fianna, avoided most of the battles between the Catholics and the Protestants, the Unionists and the Nationalists, to focus on the greater threat of the worm. The Galliard who held the chair of stories in the local sept, McManus, kept the people's spirits high with his tales and his songs, and kept everyone in the village focused on the goals of harmony with Gaia and the destruction of the worm. Gold McMorna spent most of his youth working odd jobs and spending his money in bars, singing rock songs with his friends. But more often than not, he spent as much time brawling as he did drinking and singing. After undergoing the first change, most assumed the young Galliard was as likely to die in battle against the minions of the worm as he was in a drunken fight with another Fianna. Then, one morning, he was summoned to the home of McManus, 
and taken to the old bard's bedside. McManus was dying of a poison wound inflicted by worm creatures during a mission to Belfast. McManus told Gull that he picked a young fighter to replace him as chair of stories. Gull was both deeply honored and overwhelmed by doubt that he could ever fill shoes as large as McManus's. Nevertheless, Gull spent the next few days at McManus's side, learning all he would need to fulfill his new duties as chair of stories. When McManus finally let go of his life, it was Gull who sang the dirge at his funeral. With a voice filled with sorrow and greatness, Gull McMorna, the Galliard, was truly born. Gull has since worked to check the temper of his youth, but he's still good for a drink, or three, and a story, and the occasional brawl. He does everything he can to prove himself worthy of the trust that McManus and the Sept have placed in him. And all the village, except for Gull himself, feel that he has succeeded admirably in that. Number 5. Stuart Brown The ragabash muckraker Stuart Brown was born to Margaret and Colin Brown, both Fianna kinfolk in the Appalachians. At his father's insistence, Stuart never learned about his Garu heritage and lived a fairly normal human life. But he was both stubborn and inquisitive, so he decided to be a journalist. However, he disagreed with most of what was taught to him in journalism class at Community College. The hypocritical demands of objectivity cut through with suggestions to find an angle, or rather, slant the story to suit the editors and owners, rubbed Stewart the wrong way. So he opted for a gonzo style of journalism, placing himself and his opinions at the center of the story. Essentially, BuzzFeed and Breitbart before the advantage of the internet. After he convinced a local paper to carry one of his investigative pieces, Stewart began traveling around America to research more stories. Eventually, a national paper picked up on his abrasive but thorough style and his career took off. Stewart underwent the first change while prying into the business of a corrupt city commissioner and only survived thanks to a local pack of Garu who recognized him as a Fianna. Since then, Stuart Brown, or Stalks the Truth, as he is known among the Garu for his obsession with sniffing out stories, has led a double life. To the human world, he's an abrasive, cynical, investigative journalist, digging into the darkest corners of American society. Secretly, he is a crusader for Gaia, and many of the individuals or organizations that are the subjects of his exposés are worm-tainted. Stewart also courts as much controversy among the Garu as he does among humans. He has loudly denounced the Celtic fixation of his tribe and the idea that only Fianna whose bloodlines trace back to Ireland are worth anything. His other claim to fame was when he called the Silver Fang King, Jonas Albrecht, a whorehopper to his face. Much to the surprise of everyone, King Jonas, rather than split Stewart open from his throat to his crotch, spent the night getting rip-roaring drunk with a salty Fianna journalist. Number 4. Son of Moonlight While the Ard Ree, or High King of the Fianna, Bronn McFian, has become more distant in recent years, his apparent successor, the Elder Lupus Theurge, Son of Moonlight, has become more engaged with the affairs of the tribe, and perhaps more importantly, less angry. Son of Moonlight was born in a zoo in Leinster, the first and largest of his litter. When he was placed in a pen with another male wolf, the fight for dominance naturally began. It was during this fight that Son of Moonlight underwent the first change and tore his way free of the zoo's bars. The Fianna found the newly changed Garu and brought him to the cairn of Bru Naboin. After his initiation, Son of Moonlight served as a warder of the Tri-Spiral Sept, and was secretly an adherent of the Mother's Fundamentalist camp, a group of Fianna who supported the revival of the Impergium. But Son of Moonlight's saving grace was that he was more interested in defending his fellow wolves than in slaughtering humans, though it occasionally came to that. His hatred of humans changed thanks to a human woman, Nev Flannery, who showed the wolf that humanity had as many virtues as he believed it had once had flaws. Since then, he has become a vocal critic of the Mother's Fundamentalists, as his feelings for Nev grew from grudging tolerance to respect, and finally, into love. 
As a Theurge, Son of Moonlight is the foremost Master of Rites among the Garu of Ireland. Additionally, he has demonstrated not only the ability to lead, but a willingness to listen to the advice and concerns of others, which won him popularity with the Fianna of Europe and America. The greatest example of this was his enlistment of American Fianna Pax in reclaiming the Cairn of Gloom and Sorrow in Scotland. In the final days, Son of Moonlight began making tentative contact with Margrave Yuri Konietzko through a proxy, Robert McNabb. While Son of Moonlight is respectful to his fellow Theurge, he is wary of the Shadow Lord and his plans for the Garu Nation. Number 3. Braun McFeehan Braun McFeehan has known no other life but that of a Fianna. His father was kin, his mother a Garu, and he was born within the bond of the Tri-Spiral Sept in Ireland that he would eventually lead. After his first change, Bronn rose to become the greatest war bard of the Sept before claiming the title of Ree from its previous holder. It was at this point that he came to the attention of Brendan O'Rourke, then Ard Ree of the Fianna, who returned rule of the tribe from the United States to Silver Tara in Ireland after 30 years. In keeping with the tradition of the Tri Spiral, Bronn took the name Mach Fian on his ascension to Ree and then became O'Rourke's successor. When O'Rourke disappeared into the Umbra after the Third Battle of Silver Tara, the Council of Rees voted in Braun as a matter of formality. Braun's most controversial policy since then has been the restoration of the old alliance between the Fianna and the Fey. The Ard Ree appointed a troll as his bodyguard and allowed changelings into Tara for the first time in centuries. However, the politics of the Fey, especially of the Shi, may prove more than Braun can handle. Dealing with the mercurial changelings occupies much of Bronn's time, forcing him to leave many tribal matters in the hands of Son of Moonlight. Some Fianna whisper that Bronn is face struck or even glamoured. The truth is much simpler. Bronn McFeehan feels overwhelmed and under-equipped to handle the demands placed on him as Ard Ree. He doesn't help himself by isolating himself from the Fianna and keeping his own counsel. He clings desperately to the hope of an alliance with the Fey, which he believes will tip the balance of the apocalypse in favor of the Garu and Gaia. Number 2. Ossian The Garu, for all of their might, have their season on the earth and then die. But not so the Fianna Galliard Ossian, son of Finn, a Garu warrior, and Saive, a Seelie Fey. Saive was a noble of unearthly beauty, but had become an object of obsession to a mage by the name of Far Dortka, or the Dark Man. The mage transformed Saive into a fawn until she would agree to love him. But Finn and his pack broke the curse on her. She and Finn then fell in love soon after. But mages are creatures of terrible will, and Far Dorka would not be denied what he believed was his. The mage captured Saive a second time, and she was never seen again. Finn searched for her to the point of exhaustion, until he and his pack encountered a young boy, protected by two powerful fey warriors, his guardians. The guardians fought the pack to a standstill until Finn recognized the boy as his, his and Saive's. Ossian was a child of Gaia and Arcadia, and had inherited the strength of both. As he grew into manhood, he became a champion against the worm. In time, he took a mate and sired a child, who grew to be a great warrior in his own right. But Ossian suffered the first of many terrible fates when he outlived his own son, who perished in battle against the forces of Far Dorka, the mage who stole his mother. Ossian's rage was terrible, and he hunted the mage until he was tricked and trapped by Dorka's ally, the unseely fay, Nieve. For over a century, Ossian was her prisoner, as his own tribe found themselves locked in battle against the newly fallen White Howlers. During his century of captivity, Nieve tormented Ossian with visions of beauty and vileness and songs made of pure pain. His own songs were the only thing that protected him from her wiles. Nieve even tried to get a child from Ossian, but he rejected her. Finally, Ossian was able to call upon his totems and spirit allies to give him the strength to escape back to the real world. 
As the spirit prevented Nia from pursuing him, she screamed a curse at him, that he would seek out powerful blood as she did, and he would bear the full weight of his absence from the world. As soon as Ossian's feet touched Gaia once more, the Unsealy's curse enveloped him. His glossy red fur turned white as snow, and pain racked his body. In Hamid form, his body became bent and frail. Worst of all, his stomach cramped for one of blood. Even worse, he was a stranger to the Fianna, until he sang songs to them of the tribe's glorious past. Ossian hunted constantly to fill the void in his body, and the Fianna finally expelled him from their ranks. He left, but swore vengeance against the tribe he had once been a champion of. Then, one night, Ossian met a nun who tried to convert him to Christianity. Something about the woman's scent and the stillness of her blood drove Niev's curse in him wild, and he attacked her. She was far stronger than she appeared, but Ossian killed her all the same. The nun had been a vampire, and the taste of her rich vitae fed the curse. The weight of age and frailty drained away, but it was quickly replaced with the guilt and revulsion for what he had done. But the taste, and the pleasure, and the reward were too good for him to resist. In time, Ossian accepted that Gaia had turned her back on him, and that damnation was his fate. For the next five centuries, Ossian, once a champion of Gaia and the Fianna, hunted vampires for their blood to sustain himself. The Ossian of the final days is a deadly but pitiable creature. He despises the vampires he preys on to prolong his mockery of life. He despises the werewolves who turned against him. And finally, he despises himself for succumbing to the addiction to Vitae and the constant pain that racks his body. The only reprieve from his curse was a brief time in the 1960s when he met a woman who possessed some power to see through his curse to the young Fianna warrior that still remained in him. Ossian left her with child, though he never knew it. That son, Seeker, underwent the first change and was taken in by the children of Gaia. Seeker knows that Ossian is his father and has sworn a vow to free him from Niev's curse and finally allow him to rest. Ossian's current companion is a woman named Bianca, a black spiral dancer masquerading as a glass walker who is also an agent of Niev. Niev still desires Ossian's seed for some unknown purpose and has instructed Bianca to seduce the ghoul werewolf by whatever means. Bianca is uncertain as to why she must bear this menace, but Niev has promised to reward her greatly if she succeeds and torment her beyond imagining if she fails. Bianca also uses Ossian as a shield against the Garu who hunt her, most notably Itra Moonshadow, who is on a quest to destroy Bianca for crimes against the Black Furies. The Wendigo of Canada have summoned the terrible spirit, White Manitou, to hunt down and slay Ossian. They have seen visions in which Ossian becomes a physical vessel of the worm itself. Against the White Manitou, Bianca becomes Ossian's protector. The Uctena and the Red Talons are also aware of the Wendigo's summoning and plan to kill not only Ossian, but Seeker as well for fear that whatever worm taint exists in Ossian will pass on to his son after his death. Number 1. Ku Cullen In the time of King Conquabar, King of Ulster, Detina was pledged to be married to Swaltum. At the great feast to celebrate the wedding, Detina fell into an enchanted sleep. As she slept, she was carried off by a kami, a spirit in service to Lu, son of Sian of the Tuatha de Danann, and Ethlin, daughter of the Fomorids. A year later, a flock of birds, led by Korax were ravens, came to Emen Maka and stole all of the food, inciting the men of Ulster to pursue them. The chase took the better part of a day and a night. The ravens disappeared at a small cottage where a young man offered the party sacred hospitality. He was the spirit that had taken Detna a year before. During the night, the men thought they heard a woman screaming. By morning, the young man was gone, and Detna was among them, holding her newborn son, and Lou's son. She had sent the Korax to bring the Ulstermen to the cottage so that they might return mother and son to Emain Maka. 
Conquabar decided that the child would remain with Detina and Saltum until he was of age. Detina then gave her son the name Setanta. One day, Conquabar set out to attend a feast in honor of the smith, Cullen, when he saw a group of boys playing on the green of Emain Maka. One boy played against three fifties and they could not stop him. When Conquabar inquired about this incredible child, he discovered, to his surprise, it was his own nephew, Setanta. He asked the boy to come with him to the feast, but the small, fierce child said that he wanted to finish playing and that he would follow along the king's chariot tracks. Conquabar laughed at this and then set out for the house of Cullen. When Conquabar arrived, Cullen asked him if any more of his retinue were to follow. Forgetting about his nephew, Conquabar said no. Cullen then set out his great hound in the yard, one of the last dire wolves in Ireland, a renowned beast for its savagery and cruelty against intruders. True to his word, Setanta finished his play and followed his uncle's chariot tracks to Cullen's home. The wolf howled and leaped at Setanta, attempting to devour him. In the human telling of the story, Setanta threw his game ball at the wolf with such force that it entered the beast's mouth and exited through its rear. Big ouch! But the Garu know better. Setanta underwent the first change, shifted into Krinos' form, and split the wolf nearly in half. The feasters, hearing the sounds of battle in the yard, came running out. Conquabar pushed his way past the gawkers to see his nephew, seemingly unhurt, standing over the bloody carcass of Cullen's wolf. When asked, Setanta replied that he didn't know what happened. He only remembered throwing his ball at the wolf. One of the guests, a druid named Cothbud, was also a Fianna and recognized what had happened to the boy, and was clearly an Arun, potentially one of the deadliest he had ever seen. All Cullen knew was that his beloved hound was dead. He exploded with anger and demanded that Setanta leave his house. But the boy approached the smith and promised to give him a hound to replace the one he had slain. But until such time as a replacement could be found, Setanta would protect Cullen's home as his hound, his coup. Conquabar and his men agreed that the promise was fairly made, and Cothbed the Druid sanctified the oath by giving the boy the name Ku Cullen. Secretly, Cothbed took Ku Cullen to his sept to teach the boy the ways of the Fianna. He would then go on to fulfill his pledge to the smith and become one of the greatest heroes of Ireland and the Fianna, trained by Scatha, the warrior woman of Alba, and armed with the terrible barbed spear Ga Bolaga. To this day, Garu and mortal alike lay claim to the blood of Ku Cullen. And those were the top 10 werewolves of the Fianna. Of all of the werewolf tribes, the Fianna don't really do much for me as far as either liking or disliking them. Thematically, they're supposed to be a very stereotypically Celtic tribe, which is drink, sing, fight, rinse and repeat. But to me, they're really just kind of there. Even the teases of crossover with Changeling doesn't work because thematically, Werewolf and Changeling are very different games. So the Fianna are just kind of bland. But the next tribe, the Get of Fenris, are far from bland. If anything, I may have handicapped them given every previous mention of them involves them being assholes to whoever is around. But whether they have a good reason for being assholes, I'll leave to you to decide. Until next time.